Good morning, everybody. Um, so just to remind you, last time we discussed covariant derivatives. Um, and they appeared a little bit artificial. So we defined these things, and it was all algebra, and just to show, just to ensure that these quantities are tensors. So it's not very intuitive or instructive. But, uh, so hopefully this time we'll improve on that, and uh, show you a little more where, what the connection means geometrically. Uh, general relativity is by far and away the most beautiful area of physics, as I said before. If I don't succeed in making it beautiful, it's me, not the theory. And uh, therefore, this all looks pretty ugly, so it's my fault. Uh, but hopefully, today I'll tell you a little bit about why it's much less ugly than it appears. Um, I th was hoping to do Einstein's equations today, but I think in view of time, I'm not going to rush. So I'll just continue with the mathematical stuff, and we'll do Einstein's equations on Monday. Sorry. Um, alternatively, we can fit an extra slot if you like. I think we're fitting an extra slot in next Friday anyway. But you probably don't want an extra hour of me. So uh, <laughs> we'll do it on Monday. Okay, so let's go back to geometry. And uh, in particular, uh, geodesics. Okay, so what is a geodesic? A geodesic is the shortest path along a curved uh, space. And so that's a very natural geometric object. We've already seen uh, that the action in for a particle in Minkowski space-time is a very geometrical thing. It's just the length of the world line. It can't get more geometrical than that. So, the, the actually, I'm going to set c equals 1. So, integral minus eta mu nu dx mu dx nu. Okay, so this integral is the length the Lorentz invariant length of the world line. And if you want to be a little bit more explicit about it, you can put in the parameter, d lambda, along the world line. It's where, you, where, where the world line is, x mu of lambda. Lambda does anything, any parameter that varies monotonically along the world, world line. So I've already mentioned that the action for a particle in a general space-time is uh, obtained just by replacing g with eta. The difference is g mu nu is now a function of x itself. And of course, x is a function of lambda. So it's a more complicated thing times dx mu d lambda dx nu d lambda d lambda. OK, but it has exactly the same geometrical meaning. This is the called the proper length. of the world line. <clears throat> and when you say something's proper, that means it's fine and good quality. And in particular, it means that it doesn't independent of coordinates. OK. 
Okay, and that's obvious because if I prime everything, G prime is equal to the two inverse Jacobian matrices times G, and this guy transforms with the Jacobian matrix, and these will cancel. So, isn't it amazing that the only effect of gravity is to change the geometry, and then the trajectories of every particle moving in that geometry follow the same curve. Uh, and the curve is obtained just by extremizing the length of the world line. Uh, I say extremizing because when you use an action principle, bear in mind the classical solution you get from an action principle is either a maximum or a minimum of the action. It's not ne necessarily a minimum. And uh, uh, it's an extremum. You could say, why, why does the world work like that? Why does the classical world extremize something? And the best answer we have so far comes from quantum mechanics where basically, if you formulate things as a path integral, you see that the phase associated with any trajectory is uh, e to the i action over h bar. And if the action is in a, an extremum, then it means all the phases line up on that trajectory, the quantum mechanical phases. And they add, you get constructive interference. Any other tra trajectory, you get destructive interference. But they, again, that tells you you shouldn't look for a maximum or minimum of the action. It's just an extreme. It's good enough. Okay, so what do we do with an action? So this is S. We call it S. And we vary it. Delta S. So when we vary it, what that means is we consider some path, x mu of lambda, and then we vary the path while fixing its endpoints, let's call this one x0 mu and x1 mu, and the varied path is some nearby path, that is x mu of lambda plus delta x mu of lambda, where the delta x mu is small. We're going to vary the action and demand that the action, the variation is zero to linear order in delta x basically just saying the derivative of the action with respect to path variations is zero. So delta S is equal to minus m naught integral d lambda. Now I've got to vary this, uh, this thing in here. Um, and I already did this in... Uh, deriving the Lorentz force law. It's exactly what we did, if you remember. The only complications is, is we didn't have this factor in that derivation. We just had these two guys. So we're going to get an extra term here. But when we did the Lorentz force law, we had another term, which was the a mu dx mu d lambda. We had to vary that. So really, gravity, the, the, the force of gravity is going to be very, very similar to the electromagnetic case, except this is where the field, gravitational field, comes in. Okay, so we vary it, and as before, the variation of a square root gives you 1 over, one over a square root. Okay, minus g mu nu dx mu dx nu d lambda d lambda is a half when you vary a square root. And then you vary the argument of the square root. And this will give you minus. So first of all, I vary the g, uh, delta x alpha, dx mu d lambda, dx nu d lambda. Right, so the variation of g just gives me delta x uh, times the derivative of g. This, this is uh, delta g. Delta G mu nu. Okay, and then I vary the dx d lambda terms. There are two of them, but uh, they give the same contribution because G mu nu is symmetric. So dx mu d lambda 
the delta x new um, d lambda. Okay, so that's the variation. As usual, with an action, we often have to integrate by parts to express everything as something times this arbitrary variation delta x, and that's what we'll do over here. But before we do that, uh, it's useful to simplify things. Let's re-express in terms of uh, d tau, which is, of course, square root minus g mu nu uh, dx mu d lambda dx nu d lambda times d lambda. Okay, that's d tau. And um, you see, you'll notice in the first term, we have one inverse power of d lambda, and it comes along with the square root. So I can just convert that into a d tau. Can convert all these d lambdas into d tau. Uh, and I'll lose the square root. And over here, um, likewise. Okay, so the variation of the action just becomes delta s is equal to m naught. Uh, let us, yeah, you see I've got minus signs in, uh, yeah, I've got two minus signs here. I've got an overall minus sign, so I have a plus sign integral um, d tau one half g mu nu comma alpha delta x alpha x dot mu x dot nu. So I'm going to define and define d, uh, x dot mu equals dx mu d tau, etc. And um, then we have the second term, 2g mu nu x dot mu delta x dot mu. It's nice and simple. Just uh, involves tau and tau derivatives. Now we can easily integrate by parts. So this term is, uh, is minus 2g mu nu x double dot mu, that's differentiating the mu, the x mu. And then I get a differential of this guy, which is minus 2 g mu nu. Now remember, g is a function of x, which is a function of tau. So differentiating with respect to tau, I get the derivative of g with respect to x times dx d tau. Okay, times uh, delta x nu. Um, so we're almost there. See, what we'd like to do is to combine... Uh, did I do that right? Uh, sorry, I left out this x dot mu. Dot mu delta x mu. So yeah, I differentiate... I integrated by parts in tau, which means put a minus sign and differentiating this... differentiate this guy. That... that... that gives me... This term, that's just d by d tau of g uh, multiplied by what I had by, by the other terms. Uh, and I've left out here delta x, oh, well, that, that's overall. Now, uh, I'd like to, so I have almost what I want here. I've got x double dot mu, uh, and then here I've got some other term. I would like to combine this term with that one. And so, um, uh, 
well, actually, let me just write it out as it is. So we get, uh, so this equals zero for all delta x nu. We've got to relabel some indices over here because I want this alpha index to be nu. And then I have to relabel these other indices. I'll just write out the answer. That leads to um, x double dot mu Actually, before I, yeah, let me, let me just simplify it before I do that. Uh, I'm going to write uh, yes. So I'm going to write this term yeah. Um, we can rewrite this term as minus g mu nu x uh, common lambda. Notice this is symmetrical under lambda goes to mu. So I can symmetrize this guy with respect to lambda common uh, and mu as well. So this is g lambda nu comma mu times x dot lambda x dot mu. You'll see why I do that in a moment. Um, one reason is just because uh, the coefficient here was 2, coefficient here is 1. I can split this term into 2 that way. And then I'm going to relabel these indices as follows to try to make it match up. So mu can remain what it is. Nu will go to lambda. So this is now x dot mu, x dot lambda. Uh, this nu goes to lambda. And this goes to new. Okay, and we should have the following equation that um, g mu nu x double dot mu plus one half take that, um, yeah, let's take these terms first. So g mu nu comma lambda plus g uh, lambda nu comma mu. And then the first term here is right. So first term goes to that. I've lost the factor of uh, I've lost the factor of two. So if I divide by two, I'll get and 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 change the sign. I'm going to get the second term. Then I'll get this term times x dot nu x dot lambda. This term comes in with the opposite sign. So I get g mu nu, and I'm going to relabel the alpha as uh, nu. So that should be, I believe, let me see. Uh, That should be a nu. That should be a lambda. Okay, it's mu lambda nu. So now this is easy to deal with because I just multiply by the inverse metric to remove this term. So let's just do that. Uh, this becomes 
x double dot mu plus one half g mu nu g mu nu comma lambda plus g lambda nu comma nu g mu lambda comma nu x dot mu x dot lambda equals zero. Recognize anything? That's exactly this connection. It's exactly the torsion-free connection, gamma nu, uh, gamma, I've got my indices all messed up. Um, what have I got to do? I've just got to multiply this by g nu alpha. This becomes alpha, um, g alpha nu. Okay, so this is gamma, alpha, uh, mu lambda. Okay, so the the classical path, which is an extremum of the proper length is x or satisfies x double dot mu plus gamma mu, well, let's call it, stick with the same indices, alpha mu lambda x dot mu x dot lambda equals zero. Okay, and this is called the geodesic equation. Now, uh, notice that uh, the action is a very, very powerful thing. We wrote down the action. We said it incorporates the symmetry, which is general coordinate invariance, right? So the action respects the symmetry. It follows that any equation of motion you get from the action also respects the symmetry. You can't vary something which is symmetrical and get something non-symmetrical. So uh, this is obviously a tensor equation. Okay. It was guaranteed to be a, a, a it was guaranteed to be a tensor, or it's guaranteed to be a tensor equation, i.e., to be in the same equation in any coordinate system. Because it followed from uh, an action principle incorporating or respecting general coordinate invariance. Okay, so this is a very, very important theme in physics that the way to formulate the laws of physics, first of all, we know that symmetries are incredibly important. And secondly, the way to write the laws of physics in a manner which respect those symmetries is to use an action. That's the, always the easiest way to ensure the symmetries are there. And then it just follows that all the equations which come out of the action have to be uh, tensor, have to be equations which are invariant under the symmetry in this case, uh, tensor equations. So again, if you think carefully about this, this x double dot is not a tensor. x dot is a tensor, right? Because dx mu d tor, tor d tor is invariant. dx prime mu d tor is precisely dx prime mu dx nu, dx nu d tor. So dx d tor is a tensor of type one zero. But the second derivative is not. 
And obviously not, because I should really, I have to think about it. everything here as being evaluated on x of tor. And when I differentiate this a second time, I'm going to differentiate the Jacobian matrix. And again, there'll be a wrong term, second derivative term, which again will be canceled by the gamma. Okay. So, uh, so now this gamma is a beginning to appear a little bit more natural. Gamma is just what follows from uh, varying an action which is invariant under coordinate transformations. Now, it'll be useful to, you see, what we've done here is sort of two versions of the same thing. We, we uh, defined this. <coughs> where we think of v as a function of x. There's no curve anywhere. v is just a function of x. It depends on space-time. And then I took the covariant derivative. Right? But what we've done here is consider something more like d by d tor of v, where tor is a curve. So here you're supposed to think of, here you're supposed to think of some curve and then you've got a v of x everywhere in space. But of course, I could evaluate my v along the curve. So this would be v of x of tor. Right? And uh, one way of thinking about this geodesic equation is you can think of the velocity, the four velocity associated with the curve, can also think of this as the tangent vector to the curve. Um, and if I, um, if I consider the, um, yes, um, so basically this statement says, actually, let me go the other way first, but before I do that, let's think of some v, which is a function of x. We've considered its covariant derivative. Let's consider this guy. So I've got some v, depends on x. I can dig d by tau of v. And just see how does v vary along this curve. Do you think this is a tensor? Is that a tensor? If I differentiate, so I've got some curve. I work out my v. This is v mu of x of tau. This is x alpha of tau. Right? And so the, definitely this vector will change as I go up and down the curve. Is this a tensor? Unlikely. <laughs> right? Unlikely. Because if I prime everything, the v prime includes the Jacobian matrix, dx prime dx, right? And when I do, I've got to differentiate that, and that'll give me a bad term. So this is not a tensor. But we know how to correct it. How do I correct it? Add a gamma, right? And then what does that gamma multiply? It's got to multiply the v because the covariant derivative of v is proportional to v. Uh, it has a gamma v term. And what multiplies the beta? No. <laughs> no, the whole point of a connection is that when you make a derivative, it has almost all the properties of a derivative, right? So when I differentiate a product of these things, I'm going to get the sum of derivatives. Yeah, that's the only other thing you have around, is the dx d tau. OK? You can't use the v, because otherwise your derivative would be nonlinear in v. And that's not the property of a derivative. Derivative is linear in whatever it's differentiating. So it must be linear in v. Um, and that's the only other thing you have around. So is this a tensor? Pretty obviously, yes. OK, because uh, when I differentiate the Jacobian matrix, this gamma is exactly going to, uh, exa exactly going to cancel. Um, 
And so this quantity, so this is a tensor. We can easily check. This is a tensor. I'll just leave it to you to check if you wish to check. And um, it's called the parallel. So it's called, yeah, we, we just define it to be capital D by D tor of V mu of X of tor. Okay, so it is the covariant derivative of V of V along the curve X of tor. Yeah? Doesn't the second term in what you wrote there have like extra units of X? No. Um, because gamma has one derivative of the metric. With re metric is dimensionless. Oh, I see. It's got, yeah. it's got one derivative, and that cancels the dx. Yeah, but good question, because whenever you write an equation, the very first thing you should do is to check the units make sense. If they don't make sense, it's wrong. So the units have to make sense. The metric is always dimensionless. G mu nu dx mu, because the length squared is, uh, I mean, if your coordinates have length dimensions, the metric has to be dimensionless. And there are actually many ways of assigning dimensions, but that, that's one of them. And um, yeah, so, uh, so the dimensions work out in this equation. So there's one power of tau, one power of x. Um, okay, so that's the covariant derivative. So in particular, it's useful to consider what we call parallel transport along a curve. Okay, so intuitively, what this means is you have some vector, v mu, um, defined on the curve. It may come from some field which lives everywhere in space. It may just be defined on the curve, like the spin of a particle which is traveling along that curve. And we say V is parallel transported along x mu of tor if d v mu d tor equals zero. So that's just saying somebody's carrying the little flag, which has a length and a direction. And as they run along their, their world line, the vector doesn't change. Okay, so that's a very useful concept and a very geometrical concept. And of course, you're guaranteed that if you do go to a locally flat coordinate system, one in which the metric is eta at that particular point, the gamma, of course, vanishes. So locally, in every small neighborhood along this point, the way I transport this vector is, I think about it by going to a locally flat coordinate system, transport it a little bit, the connection is zero, uh, just in the obvious way, it stays a constant, and then I go to my next coordinate system, and you just keep iterating, and so this is a very intuitive thing. It's saying that the, the vector is actually constant in... Um, locally flat coordinates everywhere along the curve. So uh, likewise, if I have a vector with the downstairs index, u mu of tau, 
right, is parallel transported along a curve if d u mu d d tau is zero. But this time I've got to define it with the downstairs indices. So this i.e. d by d tau of u mu, and because it's a it's a covariant vector, I get um, downstairs indices here. Uh, So it follows F D. So let's take two of them. If D V mu D tor equals zero, I've got a parallel transported contravariant vector, and I've got a parallel transported covariant vector. Then what happens to their inner product? Then d by d tor, the ordinary derivative, because there's no index in the inner product, that's a scalar quantity, right? So you can think about this as the four velocity of the particle would be, let's say, the v, and the spin would be the u, so the particle is going along with its spin. And the inner product between the particle's velocity and its spin equals zero if and only if uh, for all u and v uh, implies that gamma for all u and v, obviously satisfying these equations, implies that gamma is symmetric. i.e. no torsion. Okay, so torsion, as I mentioned before, torsion is really a physical thing, and what it will do is change the inner product between a particle and its spin as it travels along a geodesic. So again, this is another argument. I, I, I'll just leave this algebra to do, for you to do. By the way, this is equal to d by d tor. Covariant derivative on a scalar does not have any connection. And this is equal to covariant derivatives obey the distributive law. So it's d v d v mu d tor u mu plus v mu d u mu d tor. And um, uh, this you can express in terms of... Uh, DV, this is uh, d by d tor of v plus gamma v, and this is uh, this is uh, d by d tor of u plus minus gamma u. And when you work it out, you'll see the way it arises is with the lower indices reversed. And so, requiring that parallel transported vectors have a constant inner product on uh, on any curve is is the same uh, on a curve is the same as requiring that the torsion vanishes along that curve okay so now we're going to go to the riemann tensor and I get, again, I want to use parallel transport to get it because it's more geometrical. Uh, we could just get the Riemann tensor algebraically. Um, so let's just guess what the Riemann tensor is algebraically. How do I make... Let's do that first. It'll be very unsatisfying because it's just algebra. Okay. 
but um, how do I make tensor from the second derivatives of the metric? So how do we make, how do we build a tensor from the second derivatives of the metric. Okay, so we have various things lying around. We, we know that we have this covariant derivative. Um, and we know we know how this acts on various quantities. So, for example, uh, a vector. What I would like to do is to build something which was independent of any vector that it added on, acted on. Okay? So, obviously, this is not. One derivative is not. Any ideas what I could do to build something out of derivatives um, acting on some quantity, but I want the thing I build to be independent of the quantity. It sounds a bit difficult. Let's try and do electromagnetism, because that's easier. So, in electromagnetism, let me see. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch. Um, yes, in electromagnetism... Uh, I've already told you at some point that the way to make a covariant derivative in electromagnetism is this. How do I get f mu nu out of this? This is just a derivative. How do I get f, how do I get the field strength out of this? I know the field strength is d mu a nu minus d nu a mu. So what does that suggest? I've got this as an operator, right? This acts on things. You put something here and you get a number out. So, um, how do I get this from here? Commute. Commute it, right? So, if I do this, okay, and let's imagine we had some scalar function there to act on. You can see what happens is this is equal to the commutator of partial derivatives is zero because partial derivatives commute, right? So, but this guy will act on this guy acting here. So this is going to give I d mu a nu, this term multiplying by that. Now I have to commute the operators and act in the reverse direction, right? So that, or act with this one on that one. And this is going to give minus d nu a mu. And then finally I'll have the commutator of this with that, but that's zero because these are just numbers. This is a field, so nothing happens. So this is exactly I F mu nu phi. Okay, so the commutator of derivatives gives you a field strength. So that suggests when I do gravity, how do I get something interesting? Just take the commutator, right, of the covariant derivatives. So let us calculate the commutator of the derivatives acting on some vector. Why do I act on a vector? Well, um, the covariant derivatives are a little boring acting on scalars, because scalars you won't get any indices, um, at least, uh, you know, well, you could do it for scalars, let me say, and you won't get anything interesting. You can check that for yourself. The first interesting case is a vector, um, what do we know about this quantity? What can you say about it within the context of general relativity? Is it a tensor? Yeah, it looks like a tensor, right? These, by design, these operators turn tensors into tensors. This is a tensor. You're acting with this. It must be a tensor. So this is definitely a tensor of type uh, three zero, th uh, sorry, zero three. So this is a tensor. 
And it turns out if you do the algebra, uh, this is just proportional to V alpha. It doesn't depend on the derivatives of V. The derivatives all cancel out. And in that way, you can construct the Riemann tensor. So, uh, in fact, so in fact, so in fact, we have this equation: d mu d nu v alpha is, or v rho, is um, minus r sigma rho mu nu v sigma, uh, where r is the Riemann tensor. Sigma rho mu nu. OK, so you can just do that calculation, and you, you will find that indeed the commutator of covariant derivatives gives a tensor, uh, acting on a vector, gives a tensor. Um, uh, yeah. The index structure is not um, Thanks. That must be there, and uh, that must be there, and that must be there, and that must be there. Right. In fact, there should be a plus. Um, you might guess what is what is it acting on a lower index? Let's just guess. It's algebra to check. So commutator acting on a covariant vector, what do you think it's going to be? It also involves R, V, now, um, mu, nu are the derivative indices, and rho over here. That just gives a minus. OK, so. Uh, it's morally the same thing. There's no real difference between upstairs and downstairs in GR, except uh, a few minus signs. And uh, so that's what it gives. Um, and in fact, if you t compute the commutator on any tensor, let's say V, rho, lambda, delta, alpha, da, 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 you get a plus R term for each upstairs index and a minus r term, minus r v, plus r v, minus r v term for each downstairs index. OK, so this r, this single object, just like the connection gamma, allowed you to define covariant derivatives on any tensor. Right, it was a single object, gamma. Once I have it, I can define covariant derivatives on any tensor. The same way R allows you to compute commutator of covariant derivatives on any tensor, just with a few signs. OK, but that's algebra. It's not deeply satisfying. So let me show you another derivation, which is a bit more geometrical. And the other derivation is parallel transport. I haven't told you what the R is, uh, but you have to obviously involve the connection and uh, derivatives of the connection. But let's first derive the Riemann tensor from parallel transport. So Riemann, more geom so more geometrically, the Riemann tensor can be derived by considering 
parallel transport. So parallel transport, if I have a curve, any curve on a manifold, on a bent uh, space, on a curved space, I can, um, I can transport some uh, vector around it. We've just defined that. We need to know the connection. We can write the covariant derivative of the vector on the curve. And then you also know that if I have any curve, I can break it up into little curves. Right? This is a standard uh, uh, manipulation, which is that parallel transporting a vector along a big curve is um, So if I, in particular, you see, I can parallel transport the curve, the vector right around the curve. I, can, I give you some vector, and I say travel along some big path, and come back. Well, para, some closed curve. We're going to consider closed curves. So taking something around a big closed curve is the same or can be rewritten in terms of taking it around lots of little closed curves. Okay, why? Because I, if I take it around uh, this curve and this curve, then these two parts cancel. Okay, so taking parallel transporting a vector from here to there, um, and then parallel transporting it back, these are the same curve, so the vector will just come back to where it was. So this motivates, so consider, so, and you can just iterate this. So parallel transport along, around a curve of any size can be written in terms of parallel transport around infinitesimal curves. So let's consider parallel transporting a vector, a vector around an infinitesimal closed curve. And what we're going to find is that if space is flat, when I parallel transport my vector, it'll just come back to what it was. But when space is curved, it's not going to do that. You see, so for example, an easy way to see this is imagine that space is a sphere. Uh, let me see. I don't want to do this. Yeah, so it's so if I have some vector here, let me see. Uh, should be easy to see. If I transport, I, so parallel transport means um, I'm just trying to pick the optimal vector. Um, yeah, so let's pick a vector which is at right angles. So Look down at the North Pole, and this vector is going that way. And now I parallel transport it, the vector will be going this way, right? Because I just imagine keeping the direction of the vector the same as I move along the curve. And now I parallel transport it um, here, 
So I just drag it along the equator, and it's parallel to the curve. So it goes there. And now I parallel transport along this curve up back to the North Pole. All right, and it goes there. So you see, by taking a curve around, a vector around a curve, it doesn't come back to where it started. And what we're going to show is the Riemann curvature exactly measures the fact that vectors do not come back to themselves when you take them around a closed loop. It's easiest to calculate if we consider an infinitesimal closed loop, and uh, this will give us an explicit formula for the Riemann curvature. So let's take a little closed loop. Uh, this will be uh, x mu of tor. And I'm going to consider some vector uh, s, s uh, mu of x of tor. And uh, s is parallel transported, so ds mu d tor will equal to, uh, in fact, we'll do a lower index guy, ds mu d tor, so some covariant vector. If s is parallel transported, it means that ds mu d tor is just uh, gamma mu alpha rho dx um, alpha d tor s rho. Okay, that's the de definition of parallel transport. So this tells you exactly how the vector changes as you go around the curve. So what is the change in going around a closed loop? Well, delta s mu is equal to the integral around the loop of tor. So tor may go from, let's say, 0 to 1 as you go around the curve. That means x mu of tor comes back to itself. So it's just given by the integral of this, ds mu d tor. That's the change in s as you go around the curve. This is equal to uh, gamma mu alpha rho dx alpha d tor s rho d tor. And that, now we just get rid of the tor. So this is the integral of gamma mu alpha rho d, um, s rho dx alpha. Okay, so the change in the vector can be written as an integral over the dx. And you literally just think about all these infinitesimal vectors, dx, and you're going to add them all up, multiplied by that prefactor. Okay, so let's just raise that. <clears throat> so let's understand something about closed curves. What is this quantity? If I, if I Consider some curve made of lots of infinitesimal elements, but it's closed. What's the integral of the dx? I'm going to add them all up. I would literally just picture the curve, and then there's a dx, and a, another dx, and another dx, and another dx. Right? You just keep doing that. You add all those vectors up. Zero. OK, and... Uh, if you want, so geometrically, it's obvious. This should be 0. If you want to see it more explicitly, write it as integral d tau, dx d tau, where x is the parameterized curve. This is an ordinary derivative, so this means x alpha you know, at tau initial and tau final. And since the x is the same at the initial and final, uh, this is 0. OK, so the integral of dx around a closed curve is 0. That's the definition of a closed curve. x 
comes back to its original value. What about this integral? Integral dx uh, alpha x sigma around a cur closed curve. What does that mean? So I've got to integrate around this loop, every, all the dx's, but this time weighted with another x. Okay, so first question to ask, what's the dimension of this quantity? x has dimensions of length. What, what's the dimension of this? x squared. x squared? No. Dimension is length. <laughs> length squared, which is? Area. Okay, so this is actually the infinitesimal. This is the area equals, for a small curve, this is proportional to the area of the curve. Okay, and um, so we'll define it to be A alpha sigma. It's a, it's a tensor, which... Um, it's a tensor in the limit of the curve is small. It, it's a yeah, it's a tensor which tensor quantity which depends on the the curve. Okay, all I'm going to need is it's a numbers actually, uh, but but actually it is a tensor. Uh, to see it, uh, yeah, actually not so easy to see it's a tensor, but uh, let me see, it's probably not too difficult. So uh, another way to write it, more explicitly, just do the same thing as we did there, dx alpha detour x uh, sigma, right? It's equal to this. In this form, it's very easy to see that I could integrate by parts. And because it's a closed curve, those surface terms are always going to cancel. So this is equal to minus integral detour x alpha d x sigma detour, right? Integrating by parts. And so it follows that this number, a alpha sigma, is minus a sigma alpha. So uh, the area of a curve is represented by this anti-symmetric 4 by 4 matrix in four dimensions. Um, if you think about three dimensions, this is actually, you can check all this explicitly. In three dimensions, you know that you have some surface element. And uh, so take, uh, in three dimensions, you know, the area element is represented by the cross product of two vectors, right? Let's say I have, um, let's say I have uh, uh, A, vector A and vector B then the area is A cross B. Okay, so um, this is the analog in four, uh, in four dimensions. And actually, in this form, it's valid in any dimensions. The area in any dimension is always this anti-symmetric uh, object. Okay, so this we call the area element. Okay, so that is going to be basically enough for us to derive the Riemann tensor. Uh, so let me show you now how that works. So we're going to we're considering this infinitesimal closed curve. It's very small, and therefore to approximate the integrand, the gamma, to approximate the gamma in the integrand, um, 
and the S in the integrand, both of those are functions of tau. Um, we can approximate both of them by uh, doing a Taylor series in X. So the infin infinitesimal area or infinitesimal curve, and that means we can do a Taylor series in gamma. So, so I'm going to assume this curve is centered on zero. Centered on x mu equals zero. Again, you could center it on an arbitrary point, and all it would change is that the algebra gets more complicated. Uh, when you do your Taylor series, you'd expand in x minus that point. But it's easier just to pick the point to be at x equals zero. Um, and so now the connection is obviously given by its value at zero plus the derivative of the connection times um, x lambda plus dot dot dot. The value of s is given by its value at zero plus the derivative of s. This is evaluated at zero, at zero times x nu plus dot dot dot. So you can just do a uh, so Taylor series around x equals zero. So it follows that the change in s, change in s mu, in going around this closed curve, is equal to the integral of gamma rho mu nu s rho dx um, rho mu alpha rho alpha. So I just have to do this integral. Now you can see what happens is that in the, um, the terms linear in x, well, first of all, the constant terms. So I multiply the two constant curves, terms, I get integral dx as zero around a closed term, closed curve. Curves, the terms linear in x, let's just keep those. So I'll keep this term multiplied by that, and this term multiplied by that, and that's going to give me the area. Okay, so obviously I get something times the area. Let's work that out. So it's equal to, so the constant term vanishes. Vanishes because, um, because integral dx is zero. So we just keep the linear term in x and we get integral d lambda gamma mu alpha rho s rho plus gamma mu alpha rho d lambda s rho times x lambda dx mu approximately this Okay, dropping the x squared term in the integrand. The x alpha. Uh, well, it's x, x, x alpha, x beta. Dropping, dropping any terms quadratic in x. Okay, so I multiply this by that, but I'm going to drop this term. Why can I drop this term? Because it's quadratic in x. Let's call it lambda nu. And obviously, when I integrate that around a curve, I get integral dx times x times x. That's third order in the, in the length of the curve. This, uh, this guy is second order. This is the area. OK, so I have to believe that dropping these higher order terms 
gives a negligible contribution in the limit as the area goes to zero. Okay, um, so we're almost, we're almost there because what we know is that, um, is that S is parallel transported around the curve. Okay, so this derivative of S is equal to um, this derivative of S is equal to, we can replace it with the gamma S alpha. Okay, because S rho is parallel transported around the curve. And so uh, what we have here is a combination of the derivative gamma and uh, gamma squared. And so this leads us to d gamma. These are, these are constants, right, at zero. These are all constants. This is constant. And so now I can just do the integral over the x, and that gives me the area element. And so uh, this ends up giving you um, one half r rho mu lambda alpha s rho a lambda alpha where r rho mu lambda alpha is equal to d lambda gamma mu alpha rho plus gamma mu alpha delta gamma delta lambda rho minus exchange lambda with alpha. <coughs> okay, so what I get here is uh, these two terms, but the two terms are multiplied by A lambda mu, which is anti-symmetric. And so what I do is write this term um, so obviously I only want the anti-symmetric coefficient, the symmetric part of this term gives nothing, so we anti-symmetrize this term and write the answer as one half uh, well this is, this is the anti-symmetrized part of this term multiplied by the S and the A. Okay, so I hope it's clear where all these terms come from. This came from just the Taylor series of gamma. This came from the Taylor series of S upon using the fact that S is parallel transported around the curve. And, um, and in this way, we get that the parallel transport of a vector around an infinitesimal curve just depends on this, uh, this quantity R times the vector um, times the area of the curve. So that's very geometrical. It's saying that if I take, if I follow some uh, path, any path, doesn't have to be a geodesic, any path in a manifold or in a curved space, and I carry with me a vector, and I carry that vector around the path in a parallel manner, then the change when it comes back tells me something about the geometry of the manifold. And in particular, it gives you 
the, the changes given by this tensor uh, called the Riemann tensor. Now, I haven't proved it. Well, I have actually proved it's a tensor, providing you believe this derivation. Uh, this, all the concepts involved are invariant under coordinates. I could, I could, um, uh, you know, if the cha if the change in the vector is a certain amount in one coordinate system, the change will also be a vector in another coordinate system, and the transformation between them should just be the usual transformation. So this is a tensor. This is a tensor by construction. And, uh, and you can check this if you like. It's a lot of algebra to check because gamma is not a tensor. So this involves second derivatives of the, uh, of the x prime with respect to x. This would involve third derivatives of x prime with respect to x. Uh, all those terms must cancel. The second derivative terms coming from here must all cancel. Uh, and they do, and that's what uh, Riemann discovered and, and, uh, and checked. Equally, I could have just used the, I've done, I could have done this algebra up here, the d mu d nu commutator, and you would derive exactly the same formula for the Riemann, uh, for the Riemann tensor. So I think I should end there, and then on Monday we will use the Riemann tensor to try to define some equations for the metric. Okay, so the, the idea of Einstein's gravity is that space can be curved, the curvature is measured by Riemann. What do you think determines the curvature of space? What's the, what's the only sensible quantity? So I want to write that the Riemann curvature equals something. And what's the something? Very close. The, so the mass, do, do we think mass is a good thing to put on equal to Riemann? Energy, Energy is maybe better. <laughs> uh, we have right near the beginning of the course, we defined a certain quantity which characterizes energy. Do you remember what it is? How do I write energy in relativity? I mean, for a particle, it would be energy and momentum. It's a four vector. The energy is a zero component of a four vector, right? Energy automatically comes with momentum. Energy is not a scalar quantity. But if I consider a field like Maxwell's field, I've got this field at every point of space-time. There's some value of f mu nu, right? f mu nu is a function of x. And so how do I think about the energy in a field? It's not a, it's not a vector. What is it? So this energy tensor? Yes, it's a t mu nu. So we wrote down this t mu nu, which basically went like f squared. And this stress energy tensor is uh, the quantity which specifies the energy and momentum densities at every point in space-time. And so Einstein knew all that from his special relativity work. And so basically what he wanted to write down is that Riemann should be something in terms of that stress energy. Okay, and as soon as you think of it that way, it's pretty inevitable. You're going to get general relativity is inevitable. That's really all gen general relativity is. Actually, it's a funny thing because Einstein got the equation wrong first time. What he wrote down was mathematically inconsistent. <laughs> okay. And um, then there was a famous uh, to and fro with uh, Hilbert, who was the leading mathematician of the day. And Hilbert uh, probably pointed out some issues with the equation. And then Einstein had a very difficult few months. And after uh, after these few months, he corrected the equation, and then it was consistent, at least mathematically meaningful. Uh, and when he got there, 
he realized it's just totally unique. There's nothing else you can do. And uh, so even at that point, Einstein said, I, I, I know this is the right theory of gravity. It's just no, no way around it. <laughs> no extra parameters over Newton. No new parameters, but a much more, just this geometrical picture that energy causes space to curve. So actually, John Wheeler had this famous slogan. I'm sure you've heard it, that energy caused space-time to curve. And no, sorry, energy, co co energy tells space-time how to curve. And space-time tells energy how to move. And uh, that's, that's, that's uh, GR. OK, any questions? So let me you ask you a question. This idea of parallel transport of a vector around a curve is sort of very fundamental in, in physics. I mean, clearly, if I take something around and it doesn't come back to what it was originally, that's important. Do you know of a context in quantum field theory where the same notion is used? I keep making this analogy between electromagnetism and general relativity. So um, uh, when people study QCD, quantum chromodynamics, theory of the strong interaction, you have all the same notions. You can transport a field around space-time and... Uh, the interesting situations are where, where the field does not come back to its original value when you go around a loop. Do you know what the loop is called in that framework? Wilson, Wilson loop. Yeah, Wilson loop. So Wilson loop is exactly the parallel. When I take things around a loop and they don't return to their original value, the Wilson loop is telling you something important about what's going inside that in the loop. And... Uh, so, you know, we have a very limited number of notions, and they just repeat again and again and again across all these fields. Um, any other questions? Yes, it is. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's indeed very similar to Stokes' uh, formula. Um, there are... There are analogs of this. In, yeah, I mean, it is differential. It is what, what, um, differential calculus. Vector calculus. All right, this is all vector calculus, where these are tensor. It's tensor calculus. So in vector calculus, you've got the divergence theorem and Stokes theorem and so on. What makes it harder here is we have four dimensions, and we have a curved space. Okay, but it's it's really the same mathematics. Yep. Um, what is it about QCD that makes it not compact itself? Is it the non-abelian nature of it, or? Uh, sorry, in which case? Uh, QCD, like what does it mean? Well, even the even the abelian case has something interesting. I already told you about the Aronoff-Bohm effect. Um. Okay, so the Aronoff-Bohm effect is where you have a, a solenoid, and you take, but the magnetic field is zero, and the electric fields are both zero outside the solenoid. And one way of saying Aronoff-Bohm is that you just take a particle around the loop back to its original point, and if it's picked up a non-trivial phase, you can observe an interference effect with the original beam. So I can send a beam here, and I can send a beam around to come back. And uh, these will have different phases, and you'll see an interference pattern. OK, so there'll be some interference fringe. And the phase you get here, the change in the phase of the wave function, is the integral of the vector potential times dx around this closed loop. Uh, over h bar times the charge. So, um, 
Yeah, so that's the simplest example of a Wilson loop. But you get it even in an abelian theory. Non-abelian theory, it's just a more complicated formula. Any other uh, questions? All right, I think you better have a break. Uh, have a wonderful weekend.